So thanks for coming tonight. It's a great turnout and not surprising given the topic of the evening, um, gene editing and 21st century foods, as well as a fairly compelling lineup of speakers with Perry Hackett and Dan Boydis here. Um, I'm really looking forward to an exciting session and your questions to these guys. My name's Tom Hayes. I'm the department head in genetic cell biology and development. And um, as I mentioned last time, the, the idea behind starting this forum was in order to have a better engagement with public and, and local student populations in an effort to share our research interest and how it impacts society. If you think about it, most researchers li literally every day in the lab are doing something that in 10 years, 10 years ago, was basically impossible. And that certainly applies to the topic tonight in gene editing. So in the first session that we had for the forum, basically the idea was to consider the reading of DNA. So most of you will be familiar with the analogy of how your, how your DNA sequences like a book, where the chapters in the book are the chromosomes and the words within the chapters are the gene sequences that tell a cell what to do and, and how to do it. So in the initial forum, meet your genes, the ins and outs of consumer DNA testing, we basically were discussing how the advances in genome research and advances in DNA sequencing technology has allowed us to sequence many more human DNA sequences <clears throat> and develop a capacity to peer into those sequences and understand more about the relationship between genetic variation in human DNA sequences and disease. Tonight, the subject has moved now to talking about the reading, not the reading of DNA, but the writing and the editing of DNA, which opens up, as you will hear tonight, a whole new realm of possibilities in terms of benefits for society, but also concerns. As you'll hear from Perry and, and Dan tonight, the possibilities are pretty fantastical, but they're no longer science fiction. Genome-engineered animals and plants are here now, and so I'm really excited to hear Perry and, and Dan's assessment of the field and looking forward to, as I say, your questions to them afterwards. So with that, I'd like to basically um, just read a, an introduction for both Dan and, and Perry. And I, they flipped it on me, so Perry is the one that's going to go first, and then Dan will follow. So we're going to basically do the, do the bio sketches here, and then um, Perry will start. Dan will follow and will hold questions until both of them finish their presentations. So Perry Hackett, as I'm sure most of you know this guy, <laughs> he has more than 50 years of experience in molecular genetics and genome editing. He has an undergraduate degree in physics from Stanford University and a PhD in biophysics and genetics from the University of Colorado. He did his postdoctoral research at the Max Planck Institute for Cell Biology in Germany and the University of California in San Francisco. Since 1980, he's been a professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology, and Development, and is a co-founder for the Center for Genomic Engineering and a member of the University of Minnesota Masonic Cancer Center. His research since 1964 is focused on molecular genetics, genome engineering, and human gene therapy. He has used avian retroviruses, fish, chickens, mice, dogs as model systems for investigating various transgenic technologies that I'm sure you're going to hear about tonight. The, sloop, the, the, slooping, the Sleeping Beauty transposon system was invented in his lab for non-viral gene delivery to genomes and has been successfully used in human clinical trials for CAR-T therapy treatment of lymphoma. He is co-founder of three biotech companies, Discovery Genomics, Recombinetics, which focuses on genome editing in large animals, and Novoclade, which focuses on synthetic speciation of environmentally friendly pest control. Where is Perry? <laughs> this is the guy. <laughs> All right, moving on to Dan. 
Dan is a professor in the Department of Genetic Cell Biology and Development also, and the director of the Center for Precision Plant Genomics at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Boydus graduated from Harvard College in 1984 and received his PhD from Harvard Medical School in 1990. He conducted postdoctoral research at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he was fellow of the Life Science, where he was a fellow of the Life Science Research Foundation. Prior to joining the University of Minnesota in 2008, Dr. Boydus was a professor at Iowa State University. His research focuses on developing methods to edit plant genomes, and his laboratory has developed powerful genome editing reagents, transcription-activator-like -like effector nucleases, or TALINs, which was heralded by the Science Magazine as one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of 2012. Dr. Voidis' lab is currently optimizing methods for efficiently making targeted genome modifications in a variety of plant species to advance basic biology and develop new crop varieties. In addition to his position at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Voidis co-founded Calix, an agricultural biotechnology company that uses gene editing to, for crop improvement. He currently serves as chief science officer for Calix in 2019, Dr. Voidis was also, give him a round of applause, elected to the National Academy of Science in recognition for his outstanding work. And where's Dan? <laughs> so as I say, I'm looking forward to an a, um, intriguing and, and a vibrant discussion, and we'll start off with Perry. And follow with Dan, and as I say, we'll, we'll, we'll cover questions at the end. Thank you all for attending. I'm impressed that there are so many people here, and I know you're thinking I should be 10 feet apart from everybody here, just to be sure. Uh, but it's a little more uh, uh, friendly here. So to begin with, I'm here to talk about Minnesota and why I think Minnesota actually is going to be the hub of 21st century agriculture that's going to be led by folks like Dan, who are next up. So why are we here? Well, it's because scientists, engineers, physicians have done an outstanding job in keeping more people alive for longer times than ever and as a result, we have a huge population that is demanding more and more services. The orange line there is population growth going up. I've noted where we are right now today. The purple line is CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. I think we all know what that means. One of the things it does mean is climate change. And for all the talk of rising sea levels and things like that, one of the biggest issues that are going to emerge from climate change will certainly be displaced agricultural activities. Uh, we're seeing that right now with uh, the burning of the rainforest, desert, deserts being created where they weren't before, flooding. In the lower left, you see that we know that the average caloric intake of folks is scheduled to rise as more and more people rise out of poverty into the middle class. This is from the uh, FAO of the United Nations. And we also know that energy consumption throughout the world is going to increase over time. All of this is aggravating the infrastructure of the world. Now, it's in Minnesota's DNA, though, to solve agricultural problems. Norman Borlaug was responsible for the first green revolution when he hybridized as many different grains as possible. This was a very unnatural activity. The genomes were unknown. DNA actually hadn't been thoroughly identified as the uh, beginning uh, genetic material at the time. And the result was an immense leap in productivity per acre throughout the world as people found different combinations of genomes really worked well. But around 2000, it peaked. 
but the population didn't stop at that time. And before his death a few years ago, Borlaug said, genetic engineering is going to be the next step in feeding the world. Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Prize for feeding more people than any other person in the history of the planet. Now, we've already started. Uh, beginning about 25 years ago, genetic engineering of crops began. Genetic engineering of animals, well, there aren't any genetically engineered food animals that are available which is ironic because the first genetic engineering of cells were mammalian cells, and plants were several years behind. It's much easier to engineer animal cells than it is plant cells. The map on the right shows various countries where there are GM crops being raised, and you'll see an immense expanse of uh, countries where there's virtually no uh, genetic engineering going on. At this point, you're probably thinking I should sit down because there aren't any genetically engineered animals, and Dan will be talking about genetically engineered plants, but I'm a professor and we like to talk. <laughs> so, so we did produce one thing. We produced Itis nasivicius, who's shown here on, on your left, both as a graduate student in the MCB building when it was first built in the year 2000. He was a graduate student of Steve Eckers before Ecker went to the Mayo Clinic. And a picture taken about four years ago. Itis has engineered every single transgenic animal that you can buy in the United States or Canada right now. Here they are if you haven't seen them. They're, they're in every pet store. More than 50 million have been sold. Now, one of the issues has been that they're cataloged as or classified by the FDA as animal drugs. And they have to fall under the same stricture as drugs do, as aspirin do. So swimming aspirin right here. In fact, regulation of genetically modified organisms is a mess. As a result of the way politics worked itself out in, in the 1980s and jurisdiction of various uh, organisms was split between the FDA, which took genetically engineered animals, USDA, which took genetically engineered plants, and the EPA, which is involved with genetically engineered pest species such as mosquitoes. And occasionally they overlap. But the policies that these different agencies have are vastly different. And really some are paying attention to modern science and what it's produced, and other agencies haven't. So, I'm proposing that we begin to think about genetics not as some mystery way of altering life, but rather to start thinking about genetics in terms of algorithms, because genetics is about algorithms. And what you're looking at right here is a little mouse embryo, and I'll just start this. I think I'm going to start it. There we go. And what you're seeing is program development of a mammal, just like us, from a one-cell stage, and it just keeps going. But it's all programmed. Now, we know about algorithms. I think a few of you have one of these, like Hello. Maybe all of you? <laughs> Can you get by without them? And the one thing I'm sure of is you don't care about this side of the phone. You don't care about what's in between the flat surfaces of the phone. You just don't care. What you care about are the applications. And all the, I'm old, so I don't have very many. Many of you have a lot more. 
Well, genetics isn't that different. Instead of zeros and ones, we have A, G, C's, and T's. You all know that. We store the information in DNA, and then our readers and the operating systems for working with that information in the DNA, of course, comes from cells or amalgams of cells, which we call organisms. And the result is not programs on a cell phone or in a computer, but programs that give us new medicines, new crops, new animals. But I can't talk too much about animals, just a little bit, because they've been virtually forbidden. But this is what people care about. It's these apps. But it's not Apple, it's not Google, that comes out with these apps anymore. It's tens of thousands of people who can imagine how an iPhone can be used, how you can use algorithms if you have a device that can run them. And I just thought it might be interesting to think about translators that you can download. If you're a carpenter, you turn the phone into a level. And if you're an eye doctor in Africa that goes out into the bush, you have an ophthalmology clinic, an ophthalmoscope that you can attach to your iPhone. This becomes a $100,000 clinic because somebody wanted to use the ability of this phone for an application they had. And that's what agriculture is going to be. Not this system of blockbuster seeds that are only for a few crops, but an incredible diversity that can match every microclimate, every custom that different cultures have in order to grow what people want and need in the future, as well as medicine. So Tom alluded to this. I come from the San Francisco Bay Area. He outed me on that. And on, on the left, you see what the Bay Area produced in the late, it's from 1950 on. Transistors were invented there. And of course, recombinant DNA was patented there. And Genentech arose from there. And that gave us these guys. But then, in the 21st century, we had people like Dan Voitas who invented ways of editing DNA. And it was a total and complete game changer, as you can read in yellow at the bottom of the slide. And I, I'm not going to take Dan's uh, story. He can tell it himself. But essentially, genome editing allows you to make one change in six billion base pairs. That's the equivalent of altering a single character or space in a thousand books. And we can do it with incredible precision and reproducibility. So what are we going to do with this technology as far as animals are concerned? You'll hear about it from Dan. We got a bit of publicity at Recombinetics for choosing an initial project that we thought would couple the power of genome engineering with animal welfare, but also something that farmers want. So all dairy cows have to be dehorned. That's for the protection, of course, of the people who are working with the cows, but it's also for the protection of other cows in the density of dairy barns. If a fly goes by and they shake their head and they have horns, that's an injury, and no one wants that. So they're either sawed off or scooped out or burned out. You can go online. It's not a nice procedure, but it has to be done. But there are certain breeds of dairy cattle, excuse me, beef cattle that don't have horns. So the issue is, how do we move that genetic locus that bit of DNA from a beef cow into a dairy cow. And the standard way is just by crossing them and then back selecting. The issue, though, is, is that dairy cows have a high 
quantity and quality of milk, whereas beef cows, of course, have the same, but it's meat and, and, and not the milk. And in today's farming communities, you want the best of the best for your particular products. If you cross the animals together, you completely mix up all of the selected traits, and you have to keep back crossing, as we say, in order to get back to a dairy cow that was the same dairy cow but just lacks horns. But with the Voitas technology, in one step, in one year, we could accomplish that. And tonight we have the geneticist and uh, CEO of Acelogen who actually did this in the audience and produced the first polled animals. Uh, and you can see not the first polled animals, they're dead, but you can see their offspring and their offspring's offspring. And you can see they're dairy cows and they don't have horns. All right, and there's a lot of specific issues you can look at, but the fact is these cows are exactly what was wanted. But there's more than that that we need. Uh, one of the problems with global climate change is that it's getting hotter and more humid in some places, especially in tropical areas. If you take a Wisconsin Holstein, and take them to Africa or to South America, they don't do well because of the climate. They're stressed. Is there a way of finding a way of accommodating heat and humidity for cows so that areas can have fewer cows with the same production of milk or beef? And the answer is yes, with this locust called slick. And again, what Tad Sonstegard has engineered in are cows now that can accommodate heat and humidity. Something that's on the drawing boards in some countries as far as animal cruelty and welfare is concerned is stopping castration of male animals. Well, folks, you don't need a lot of boars. They don't taste good. And of course, they don't behave properly. The same thing goes with bulls, and you certainly don't need bull dairy cattle. But castration is extreme, some people would think, and so one way around it, again, is to genetically engineer animals so that they're essentially not exhibiting the male characteristics that are undesirable in farmland. You can get around this. Genetics is magic in a sense in that way. So these are things that we have. They're not commercialized yet. It's a long road with current uh, statutes and the like. Um, and it may not be the United States that sees the products of this type of technology first. Other countries are looking into it. But we're building, actually, on a longer history. Over the past 25 years, hundreds of genetically engineered animals have been created. And you can read it as fast as I can uh, read it. None of them have made it to market because all of them have been tainted by the words GMO. I give you one example because we're on Interstate 35, and when we go south, we go through Iowa. And when we go through Iowa, we make sure that the windshields are rolled up so that we don't smell Iowa. And the reason why you smell Iowa are the pig lagoons, and those lagoons stink like hell because of all the phosphorus in them. And a genetic engineer in Guelph, Canada, engineered pigs with phytase genes that would be active in the salivary glands in order to break down this phosphorus and reduce the amount of phosphorus in the poop dramatically. No one would touch that pig. Licenses were available for one dollar to use for whatever. No one thought that you could sell any of these pigs for bacon or whatever because of GMO. That's the cost. 
Well, it's 2020, and if there's one thing we understand, and we're understanding it better and better and better, it's viruses and how they spread and all the damage they can do when they're unchecked. And again, you can read faster than I can read it to you. Right now, foot and mouth disease or hoof and mouth disease virus is causing, this is a conservative calculation that I did. The one that I ca actually came up with was $63 billion just in China for two years. And then there are some lesser ones that are merely $100 million and more a year. These are incredible losses to the farmers that are involved, but also an incredible expense here in the United States to keep these viruses out. We're learning how hard it is to keep viruses out. So what's the solution? Well, this is about as complex a slide as I'll show. But it basically says that everybody has to be a winner when it comes to genetically modified organisms and especially farm animals that you're going to be eating or whose products you're going to be eating. You have to benefit the, the farmer himself. And we want higher productivity. We want much higher productivity for obvious reasons. We can't keep taking pristine lands to feed more people. We have to have more production per acre. Consumers want something that's very safe, but they also want to feel better about what it is they're eating. Of course, sustainability is critical in the 21st century. And animal welfare, that goes without saying. Happy animals will always produce more than unhappy, stressed animals. And the farmers want to work with happy animals rather than unhappy animals. These are no-brainers. So, in fact, agricultural markets are far, far more demanding for reasonable things that we all want than governments that appear to be more concerned with things called marker genes, plasmids, any number of things that exist throughout our bodies anyway because we have a microbiome, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, and microbiomes all have active CRISPR systems, they have active plasmids, they have active just about everything that the government doesn't want in cells. But will you want to eat GMO products? And the answer in general is, of course, a resounding no, if you read and listen to people talk. And if you, of course, if you're a CEO trying to generate a little bit of investment in what has to be our future. So I thought I'd show you what's really going on. And I'll start with my students here at the University of Minnesota. Essentially, every class I teach I start off with a slide similar to the one on top. Have you eaten genetically modified GM food? And you can see from last year, it's an amalgamation of two classes, over 90%, with around 10% saying, I'm not sure what it is. But I've been doing this for a long time, and it has ranged from 60% back in 2009 to my last class, which was 89% uh, just a few weeks ago. And then when I asked the question, well, what is it that you want to eat? Two thirds of the class says, I want something that's affordable. A very small percentage of the class says, I don't want GMOs. Some people want natural or organic, but most of them don't even know the difference between what natural and organic is. Well, the world is not University of Minnesota freshmen, I know that. So the Pew Trust went out and surveyed people 18 months ago. And you can read what they found. And what they show is that at the very bottom, the only commercialized animal, roughly 20% approval, is the only animal you can buy today. 
again, 50 to 100 million sold. So it's not as bad as people would have you believe. But that's still, the central question is, GMO food is unnatural. How do I know it's safe? Well, what you're looking at are a variety of uh, things that people do eat around the world. Snails, embryonic birds, maggots, spiders, all kinds of things. The fact is, is that somebody eats almost, together we eat almost everything, <laughs> except for things that are clearly poisonous. But we as individuals don't eat everything. Very few people will eat in what's in the lower left, which is a triple cheeseburger. Why in the, that's, that's pretty unnatural when you get right down to it. <laughs> Anybody here like eating at foreign restaurants? You think? I know there's a couple of people that probably don't, but most people do. And you ask why, I ask my class why, and what it comes down to is spices and the exotic tastes that you get. Well, here are some spices, lots of them. Did you know that spices are the most feces-ridden, urine-soaked foods you will put into your mouth? The FDA tells you that. You're not worried. You like eating them on the food that, that you eat in foreign restaurants and maybe even at home because they're perfectly safe and they give you interesting flavors. So much for the right to know what you eat. You can look it up on FDA websites. It's there. But then comes the next step. Foreign foods seem natural, but GM foods don't. And then we have something, a headline I saw in the Star and Tribune a couple of years ago. And then, of all things, it was used by the head of the FBI, Department of Food Integrity. And he used, you are what you eat, in a talk that he gave. And I talked to him and said, are you promoting cannibalism? <laughs> I seriously, dude. And he said, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> and I won't use it again. <laughs> so, so why are we afraid of unknown genes? When, in fact, if you have a quarter pounder, you are ingesting a roughly 100 trillion genes. That's one followed by 14 zeros. And you don't know anything about them. I'm serious. I don't know anything about them. OK? Relative risk of non-GMO foods. This is a meta-study. Each one of the data points on here is an individual study. Almost everything is safe to eat and causes cancer, depending upon which study you take. With the exception of olives, which are safe, and bacon, which everybody loves and still eats. All right. So what are you going to do with GM foods? How in the world can you evaluate GMOs and have any trust when you get this for the very natural foods that people eat? And thank goodness, yesterday, for the first time, yesterday, the FDA came out with a whole website on this and ways of introducing the American public and other people to GMO foods. And this is just a small screenshot where they say, there's no difference, folks, between GMO and non-GMO, except that possibly it's better <laughs> because it's been uh, treated to be better. Of course, in other ways, they go on to explain that it reduces pesticide use and things like this. So what is it? Why are we worried about food safety? And of course, that's the panel below that comes from data with the uh, FDA. There was a scare roughly 12, 22 years ago with something called Starling Corn, where there was a real problem with whether or not GMO corn caused allergies. The Centers for Disease Control came in, 
tested everybody who thought they had an allergic reaction, and no one had one. That's because these tests are, are very advanced. Where do you have problems with uh, food? It's generally with improper processing, often raw foods, but sometimes, of course, with spoilage. Well, times are changing and have changed. And thank goodness for my uh, former colleague, Pat Brown, who was a biochemist at uh, Stanford University. We trained under the same person. And he started Impossible Meats. And I've had several discussions with Pat. We're not in agreement on anything. But that's fine. That's the way scientists are. But over here, you're looking at a Western meat burger and then all of the fake meats that are out there. And what are the big differences? There's primarily two. One is that real beef has cholesterol and none of the other fake meats have cholesterol. And the other is normal beef has very low sodium and the other meats have very high sodium and you can even have an orange juice and burger at the same time with uh, Beyond Burgers, all right? Impossible Burgers are GMO. They have GMO ingredients in them. That's where they get their taste. Who knew, all right? Beyond Meats is more pure and they say non-GMO. But clearly, in an era when people are going after chemical stews to eat that may be GMO and increasing in popularity, just GMO itself shouldn't be that much of a problem. So I started off by saying that I see Minnesota as being the center for really revamping 21st century agriculture. We have everything that's needed. We have a robust University of Minnesota that is producing basic research and understanding at a prodigious level. We have centers like the Center for Genome Engineering and Dan's Center for Plant Genomic Engineering that takes some of the research that's being done that might have practical purposes and bringing it those people together who often then join up and start up companies because there's a belief that actually the results that we have will be important for the people who paid for the research in the first place. That is, they validate that these research findings will have impact on the citizens and the society that paid for them. Imagine that. And if these startup companies are successful, it leads to feeding of the world. Now, it's not quite that simple. Two groups have to join in. One are the regulators, and they have to get their acts straight there. And the other is we have to have corporate investment, the corporations. And boy, do we have Fortune 500 companies here who can do that. Um, if they understand that this is the way of the future. But we've done more. Part of this issue is education. And coming out of the University of Minnesota was a Genome Writers Guild in 2017 in McNamara. And what you're looking at is last year's meeting where we had USDA, FDA, and EPA represented. These are regulators. They were meeting for the first time in a scientific meeting where investigators who were at the cutting edge of genome editing were meeting. You can see the poster sessions in the background. None of them had ever heard of such an event, and there were only 150 people there. So Mayo Clinic, July of this year. So I'll end just by saying that what the world looks like and a few decades, and yes, those are my grandkids, are, uh, is going to be totally dependent on what we start doing today and the effort we put into today. And as they said back in the 1960s when I was in college, 
you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem, but there isn't anybody on the sidelines. I thank you for your attention. Questions at the end, and now we can get to the real reason why you came here, which is to listen to Dan, who really has done so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Perry. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I mean, this is an exciting topic because uh, it's been a decade now that we've had the tools in hand where we can go into cells, living cells, alter the genetic code, um, and test the consequences thereof. So for the basic biologists in the room, we have tools now to understand gene function, um, how genes work, how they contribute to the growth and development of whole organisms. Um, and the topic tonight is how we can use these tools uh, to harness what we know about gene function to make better, more abundant, uh, more nutritious food. So the domain I work in is, of course, genetic engineering, genome engineering, but as it applies to plants. So I'd like to begin with just by talking about how we currently and, um, you know, create new crop varieties. So this lonely little wheat plant in the center of the slide, this is actually what we're after. This is the holy grail. So it's an elite variety. So what I mean by that is for decades, breeders have been selecting plants that perform better out in the field, produce high levels of, in this case, wheat grains, you know, under different conditions and different geographies. So I think of that, you know, that's a, a genetic chassis, if you will, upon which we superimpose traits that we're interested in. In this case, the trait is a disease resistance. So it's encoded by a handful of genes, typically, that we want to introduce and want to make sure are present uh, within that chassis to provide that, that particular outcome, disease resistance. So the conventional way that we would create uh, disease resistance um, so let's say you have your elite variety growing out in Iowa, Minnesota, or, or thereabouts, and you have an outbreak of a disease, so you need to incorporate a resistance gene. Typically what would you, you do is you'd survey all the wild land races and, um, to find one that's resistant. Now this wild land race is not an elite variety. It probably doesn't perform very well in the field. It might even just be a wild relative. Uh, but you'll cross the elite variety with the donor variety, you see the first product has 50%, half the genetic information of each. Um, so it's resistant, but it's probably not performing very well. And so you back cross it a multiple generations until you basically restore that genetic chassis that gives the outstanding performance, and you also maintain the disease resistance. And that takes a long time, eight to 10 years. Another approach that's been used for, well, um, close to 100 years now is mutation breeding. So that elite variety is susceptible to the disease, but uh, actually will soak it in chemical mutagens or zap it with x-rays, alter the genetic code in an unpredictable fashion, plant out huge populations, and hope we find one individual in which a genetic alteration has conferred the trait of interest, disease resistance. And then we'll move that particular product into the field. So it's a very random, uncontrolled process and genetic changes, unintended genetic, un, unintended genetic uh, changes certainly occur. So coming up now on 40 years, we've also had transgene breeding. So here we have our elite variety and we can take a gene from another organism for disease resistance, many of the genes derive from bacteria. They encode toxins that, are, that inhibit the growth of you know, uh, various caterpillars, uh, for example. So we can incorporate those genes into the plant, express uh, the proteins that we have to do it in individual cells and tissue culture, regenerate plants, and then ultimately get the variety that can be deployed out in the field. Um, this, of course, is what I would term a GMO right, a genetically modified organism. You've taken genetic information from a very distantly uh, related organism and then moved it in, into the plant to confer this trait of interest. And GMO regulation is sort of, uh, has, of, of, the eight to 10, of the eight to 12 years, about three of those years are spent on in terms of getting together a regulatory package to allow that plant to be grown 
safely in the field, make sure that it's producing food um, that, that's healthy and that the plants are not going to have a negative impact on, on the environment. And then now, 10 years, we've had gene editing as a tool. So we can go into that elite variety. If we know enough about the genetic information, the genetic code, the genes that confer disease resistance or disease susceptibility, we can go into that susceptible plant, edit the, resistant, edit this, the gene um, to confer now disease resistance. Again, we do that in individual cells and culture, regenerate plants, and then ultimately um, move them into the field. So I'd like to talk, of course, a little bit more about gene editing and how it is being used um, in agriculture. And just a little bit of sort of gene editing uh, 101, if you will. Um, so at the top, that double-stranded molecule represents the genome, the genetic code. Um, in our genomes, it's three billion plus bases. Uh, the same is true for corn. Uh, wheat actually has close to 17 billion bases, so there's a lot of genetic information within a given cell that determines how that cell grows and develops over time. If we want to edit a gene, what we do is we introduce a break in a very specific sequence in that enormous genome, a very specific sequence that we want to modify, and then we direct how that broken chromosome gets repaired. So on the left is targeted mutagenesis. We, we don't do really do anything but break the chromosome. And then on occasion, that broken chromosome gets rejoined and repaired incorrectly, and so we alter the DNA sequence at the break site. We create a mutation. On the right is a more precise editing outcome. We break the chromosome, but we, we pr uh, provide to the cell a DNA template that's very similar uh, to the site that we broke. Uh, but in green are sequences that we want to incorporate at the break site, sequences that will confer the trait of value, for example. And so this is less efficient, but, but the outcomes are, 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 are more consistent. That is, we incorporate that green sequence right at the break site. And so um, I've been working in the field of gene editing for actually 20 years now, believe it or not. And the, and the first... 10 years were all about how do you get a reagent to find the site in the genome um, that will break it very specifically, very precisely, and allow you to edit that gene. Um, and so we, we did, we're working on reagents that could hone in on those sequences. On the left are meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases. That took up the first decade of those 20 years. Um, they worked. They work, you know, when they worked, they worked really well, but it was really hard to design these reagents to find the site you wanted to modify. Uh, we developed the talent technology, which actually proved to be very um, easy to uh, engineer reagents that would find the site of, in your genome, and then shortly thereafter, the CRISPR-Cas reagents, which are really, uh, came to the fore, which are really the reagent of choice. Talons, meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, they're all proteins, and the protein binds to the DNA and determines specificity. CRISPR-Cas has a very elegant and simple uh, targeting mechanism wherein an RNA pairs to a DNA, and that determines the specificity, and then the Cas9 comes in and makes the break. So it was really about getting the, the first decade was about getting the reagent, the first decade of my career was about getting the reagents that target the site to make the break to allow you to make the edit. So, um, when we, in, when we developed the first talons, um, clearly recognized that the technology had value for basic biology to understand plant gene function, but also for, it had agronomic value. That is, we could now create traits like the disease-resistant wheat that I showed you um, that would have value uh, to the farmer and um, ensure a more secure food supply. Um, so at the time, I created now 10 years ago, a company called Calix, and so I go back and forth between my professor role and my role as chief science officer at Calix, and I've been doing so for now for 10 years. Um, but the story I'm going to tell you now is a story that emerged from Calix, where we used uh, gene editing to create really the first food ingredient, the first gene edited food ingredient um, ever produced, and we commercialized it this year for the first time. So 
this food ingredient is actually um, a cooking oil. So we derive, you know, our cooking oils come from plants. We crush the seed, extract the oil, um, and different plants produce oils with different fatty acid compositions and different properties. Um, so soybean oil is low in monounsaturated fats, 23% monounsaturated fats. Um, and what that means is the polyunsaturated fats, the presence of the polyunsaturated fats are undesirable. Um, the, the oil goes rancid, it doesn't fry for very long, and it's generally not as healthy for you. Um, so what's happened in the past is soybean oil was chemically treated the double bonds that make up the polyunsaturated fats were removed to produce more uh, an oil chemically that was higher in monounsaturated fats. So this chemical process, hydrogenation, was performed for many years. Crisco, I don't know, if you're old enough in the room to remember those jars of Crisco, that's hydrogenated soybean oil, right? But a negative consequence of this chemical treatment is that trans fatty acids were produced and trans fatty acids are definitely not good. In fact, in 2018, they were banned from the US diet, period. And the World Health Organization said, is, is seeking to ban them worldwide. So, that, so what happened is the FDA recognized this and, and, and initiated a, a labeling requirement. So tr if a food had trans fatty acids, it had to, had to be labeled. And when that labeling requirement went in, soybean oil demand uh, plummeted. So from 2002 to 2012, you can see soybean oil was replaced by other oils. Canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, oils that were higher in monounsaturated fats. So uh, we decided with the tools of genome, and, um, genome editing, we should deploy them. Why not deploy them to make a healthier oil in soybean? Um, and so um, working with Feng Zhang, who's my colleague in the department, and helped me form Calix, uh, we created a soybean variety that had an altered fatty acid composition. So this isn't a very sophisticated edit. Uh, we just inactivated a few genes to change fatty acid profile. So here on the left is the natural fatty acid biosynthetic pathway. You can see one double bond inserted to make oleic acid. Another double bond is made is inserted to make linoleic acid, and this is carried out by FAD2, a fatty acid desaturase gene that's expressed in the seed. There's actually two genes, and so we made talons to inactivate both genes, both alleles of both genes, so four, four targets were inactivated, and we're just stopping the assembly line. We're just stopping it so that now you accumulate oleic acid on the right, and you never really convert much of that product into the polyunsaturated fat. So the end result, you can see in bold there, Calix high oleic soybean oil, 80% monounsaturated fats, similar in fatty acid composition to sunflower um, and olive oil. Um, and it's proved to be a very effective food ingredient. You can fry three times as, as longer. This year, the Food and Drug Administration says you can put a tag on products that have that oil, that it's heart healthy. Uh, as compared to um, um, foods that have the polyunsaturated fats or, or oils that are higher in polyunsaturated fats. So just this simple modification allowed us to make a, have a big impact on the quality of oil uh, produced um, by soybean. It was fun this year. A few vendors at the state fair actually used our oil to fry, you know, their favorite thing on a stick <laughs> in our oil. Uh, yes, the oil was healthier, but I'm afraid what was being fried was uh, in generally not so healthy. So this is a brand new way of creating genetic variation. You know, I talked about classical breeding, uh, mutation breeding, transgenesis, but this was really one of the first products that had been created through gene editing. And so we went to the regulatory authorities, first the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and we said, uh, okay, um, we've only actually inactivated these couple genes. We've removed some DNA that inactivated them. So it's shown here in bold. Uh, the bold sequences are where our talons came in, 
and then they broke the chromosome, and the dashes represent DNA that was lost as a consequence of, you know, um, improper repair of that broken chromosome. Um, and after some time, it took a while because, uh, you know, the USDA was, gave us very careful consideration, but they said, you know, uh, chromosomes break all the time. DNA is deleted all the time. Mutations happen all the time. And this type of alteration is really no different than what occurs spontaneously uh, in nature. And so they said, as long as there's no foreign DNA, you can go plant these out in the field and, and test this product and see if, in fact, um, it has value. And so we brought a number of these products. Underlined is our hyaluronic soybean. We got a, the permission from the USDA to grow out, out in the field. But we and others using talons, meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, CRISPR-Cas systems have all gotten the same conclusion from the USDA. The type of genetic variation we created is really not that different than what can occur spontaneously in nature. So you can grow it out in the field and test your product. And indeed, we, we tested our product. Uh, Last year, we grew 36,000 acres of our product, sold the first soybean oil. Uh, we actually went to the Food and Drug Administration before we sold it because it's a food ingredient, and we wanted to make sure that you know, there wasn't anything you know, surprising or unpredictable about the oil uh, in terms of human consumption. Um, but we got the you know, no concerns from the FDA, so we could actually go ahead and sell it. And then this year we'll grow over 100,000 acres of that soybean um, producing that oil. So as a consequence of our inquiry and other, other uh, entities' inquiry about the regular, regulatory status of gene-edited crops, the USDA has proposed a change in regulation. So do not regulate plants with inactivated genes like the one I just described. Do not regulate plants with single base changes because, again, they occur spontaneously every generation. And do not regulate plants, well, so if you consider my overview slide, so uh, deletions, uh, single base changes, they can occur spontaneously, they can occur through mutation breeding. Uh, and then also uh, do not regulate plants in which gene editing is used to introduce uh, variation that already exists in nature, variation that's in a sexually compatible organism. And that goes to the upper left there. That is, if the variation's in nature and you could cross it into your elite variety, why not, you can certainly go ahead and edit it into your elite variety. Um, and so I, I think this is a very uh, reasonable framework, science-based, logical, and it really regulates the product and not necessarily the process. Um, not all geographies and jurisdictions agree with this. In Europe, if you use any type of biotechnology in the creation of a product, it's a GMO. It's regulated um, and um, falls under very strict uh, regulatory uh, restrictions. Um, so, the example I gave, actually all of these examples, moving a trait into that elite variety is about moving one or a few genes, a little bit of genetic variation to create a trait of value, right? And that's where we're at now with conventional breeding, mutation breeding, transgene breeding, and genome editing. But we're not gonna be there for very long. The technology is just uh, exploding, improving, increasing, the efficiencies are increasing, the throughput's increasing, the scale is increasing. So we're, we're gonna soon be able to engineer multiple traits simultaneously. We're gonna be able to alter the chassis itself by introducing multiple genetic changes. And am I worried about that? Not, not really. I mean, look what we did here. Right? This is 10,000 years of agriculture. We took a wild, weedy, bushy plant called Teosente, and every year went out into the field and picked one that produced a few more grains and grew a little bit better under cultivation until we created a brand new species, modern corn. So there you're talking about tens of thousands of genetic changes that we imposed deliberately to create uh, modern corn. 
and we've done it time and time again. Tomato, that little berry grows on a vine and we just selected variants until we came up with cultivated tomato. And, and just sort of as a peek into the future, uh, one of my postdocs said, you know, uh, I, can, I can edit multiple genes simultaneously. I'm confident of that. You know, the genes that drove domestication from that little berry to that cultivated fruit, we know the major drivers of domestication because we know a lot about uh, plant gene function and, and how they work. You know, he picked six genes that changed the plant architecture, changed the plant from a vine to a short shrub, changed the number of fruits produced of the plant, the size of the plant, whether or not it's like a, a, a little cherry tomato or a big beefsteak tomato, and, and how much lycopene, an antioxidant, it produces. And so in contrast, this slide shows what I illustrated earlier for wheat through classical breeding. Normally, you take your cultivated tomato, cross it to some wild species of variety that has salt tolerance or cold tolerance or drought tolerance. Back cross it multiple generations and 10 to 12 years later you'd have cultivated tomato that's salt tolerant. He said, well heck, let's just go take that wild species, edit these drivers of domestication at once and generate de novo a domesticated uh, tomato. Um, and he did it. He took um, this wild species, Pimpinella folium, and edited six genes simultaneously, turned it from a vine to a shrub, increased the number of flowers, the size of the fruit. So in one generation, he went three-fold increase in fruit size, ten-fold increase in fruit number, five-fold increase in that lycopene, uh, that antioxidant lycopene. Um, you're not going to buy this tomato this spring when you go to the nursery. <laughs> I mean, it's still a long ways away from our domesticated tomato, but it shows, it shows I think, it, or it opens up and it, it illustrates the power of the technology and, and where we're heading. Not just one gene at a time, but again, altering that entire uh, genetic chassis. So, yeah, I hope I've given you an illustration of... of I hope I placed uh, plant gene editing in context about how we currently create uh, new crop varieties. Um, I have also hope I've given you a little bit of flavor for how plant with gene edits are, are regulated by, by various governments and government jurisdictions. Uh, the technology is super powerful. The technology has uh, many applications. We have a lot of challenges in agriculture, changing climate, limited resources, be it fertilizer, water, and the like, and a burgeoning global population. So I really hope we can deploy this technology uh, for all that it offers uh, to help feed the world um, and meet some of, of the needs of this growing world population. Thank you. So Perry um, and Dan are open for questions. I think um, Jessica in the back uh, has a microphone, and Licia will run to you if you simply raise your hands. When, you know, you're, you have this powerful technology, um, which is going to grow population indefinitely. Do you feel a responsibility to talk in terms of the consequences of that unending growth of population, and if so, uh, what do you see as the ideal population, given what you can do for the world? Is there a, a, a 2050, how many people will there be on the planet, mm -hmm. and how will it work to the advantage of all species and all people, including the poor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, food supply, it's a complicated equation, right? So this is just one, one component of the solution. There's, you know, there's obviously political uh, concerns. There's uh, different cultural and geographic concerns. Um, so you can't, uh, you can't, this is, uh, this technology is not going to provide an indefinite food supply by, by any means. It's just going to, I think it can contribute to making a healthier, a healthier food, 
uh, more productive food, food that grows on more arable or, or less arable lands. Um, and you know, I, you know, it's, clearly, it's clear that we're going to need it. I don't view food production as a population control mechanism, but uh, clearly our, our population, even at present, needs more and, and better food. So I think, Bonnie, there's a couple of ways of approaching the answer to your question. The first is that there are classical ways of limiting population growth. And that chart I showed at the beginning illustrated that for 10,000 years. War that killed people, pestilence that killed people, starvation that killed people. Except for a few regions around the planet, that's not what's happening so much anymore, which is why population's going up. Governments like China and India have tried the one-child policy, and that wasn't working out either in terms of gender balance, but also unhappiness in general. So, so far we haven't found a way, and scientists are certainly not going to propose any, I don't think, because that's what science fiction is about, and that's the fastest way of being condemned overall. When I was an undergraduate at Stanford in the late 60s, Paul Ehrlich made a bet with, and I've forgotten who it was, about whether or not there would be resources by the turn of the century and whether or not those resources would be diminished and our whole society would begin to collapse. Every one of the resources that he bet would not make it, made it. In our lifetimes, we're, we're seeing oil at first was scarce, then it wasn't. Somehow science has come up with temporary solutions that have carried the day and certainly Dan's technology and what he's doing is going to help people out. I'm old enough to remember when life and society was very different than the way it is right now. I'm appalled at how crowded everything is, but that's a consequence. And my students live in an environment that's very different than the one I grew up in. And they seem okay with it. What we offer are tools and opportunities, but I don't think we're in the game of so much saying how they should be used or how they should be used for social and political purposes. That, that's when you get into big trouble. So um, as you make these improvements and as our corn crops become unified into common corn crops, as bananas become a single crop, the more you improve, the more the funnel goes towards decreasing diversification. So one of the consequences of this sort of genetic directed crop production is reducing the amount of diversification, which some people would argue puts you at, at significant danger of some catastrophic event that will might impact a crop because every crop now has the same genetic background. How do you address that? So I'll start by saying that I suggested exactly the opposite. The reason why we have so few genetically engineered crops, the blockbusters that are out there, is because we've made it so expensive to get through regulatory hurdles that only the biggest companies with huge markets can afford to be in the game. But with the technology that Dan developed and others are developing, you can produce animals for a couple hundred thousand dollars, not two hundred million dollars. And you can put them out. The whole idea of this technology is to be able to respond quickly to cultural and environmental and microclimate changes as needed. There is no reason in the future that every animal and every crop may have a very narrow purpose that is highly specific 
to be extraordinarily efficient for that so that we don't have the type of system that we have today. But by insisting upon hyper-regulation that costs enormous amounts of money and enormous amounts of time, you're never going to get there. That's the whole idea, folks, of this. Most applications on your phone were not developed by Apple and big corporations. They were developed by individuals who had a need, their need in their place. It's exactly the opposite, Brian, yeah, of what you were suggesting. Yes, and what I'm suggesting is that the world wants diversity. The world wants as many products that will work as possible. And that is possible. We just have to adjust our style. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. If you use gene editing to create what I call the chassis, a common chassis that everyone used, that's probably not a great idea. Um, so at Calixt, um, we use non-GM germplasm, actually developed here at the University of Minnesota. So it performs really well in, in Minnesota fields. And then we introduce our trait into that germplasm. So our, we contract with our farmers, and they, they're our partners, and we share in the profits with the farmers. So we contract with the farmers. They grow our soybean varieties. And it's one of five varieties. Four of the five might be GM, conventional soybeans from one of the big you know, ag biochemical companies, but one-fifth of their crop is our non-GM conventional soybeans. And so in fact, we're kind of decommoditizing. We buy the soybeans from them, crush them, and sell the oil. So we're, you know, at, at, at least in terms of the traits and the, gene, the genetics that we're introducing, it's a little bit different than what they normally would grow on their field. Hmm. So I agree with you that uh, GMO food is safe. In the worst scenario, what is the biggest uh, safety risk of GMO food? Understanding this will help us to promote this GMO food to the general public. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> the, the obvious answer is obesity. The more food, the heavier you get. I'm a walking example of it. But that's because GMO and non-GMO are essentially the same when it comes to so many aspects of health. Thank you. Um, I know that there are seed banks out there that keep track of a variety of heirloom or um, discontinued, or I don't know what the proper term is. As you guys grow different types of either animals or plants, do you protect and store those DNAs in case they are valuable for other climates or areas or time frames? Yeah, the, uh, the genetics that we work with is actually pretty limited. But you're right, there are public organizations, as well as a number of private organizations, companies that have enormous genetic resources. Um, and, you know, in, in the sort of conventional breeding example I gave, if that disease, if a disease breaks out, the, those are immediately deployed and, and tested to see if they're resistant to that disease to move in those genes and, and, and create a, a disease-resistant variety. I mean, as our molecular tools become more sophisticated, we kind of know what disease resistance genes look like. So we can actually mine the genomes of those species really quickly, pull out all the resistance genes, and then test them to see if they have um, those traits of value. So clearly that's a, an important resource and will continue to be a really important resource, that, the diversity that's available and preserved. Uh, thanks. I truly enjoyed this discussion. So, and that's uh, the question uh, for both of you, and both of you are great educators. So I can't help but wonder how come that in this country, where the way how we eat and what we eat has become a source of multiple debates and uh, um, social and political frictions, most of us, uh, including 
lawmakers still associate genetically modified food with cancer, to answer your uh, question, allergies and uh, antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. So, and in other words, how come that um, most of us, including lawmakers, again, have a fundamental lack of knowledge of food science? So uh, I talked about sort of the, the transgene, the GMO products that were created over the past 30 to 40 years. And the traits that were introduced into plants almost always benefited the farmer. Uh, weed control, herbicide tolerance, insect, pest, and path resistance. But if a consumer goes to the grocery store, you know, that doesn't really matter so much to them. And so we've taken sort of a conscious effort to make, use the technology to make traits that will benefit the consumer, make healthier food. The cooking oil is healthier. We're making a reduced gluten wheat flour, a wheat flour that's higher in fiber, a potato that when you fry it produces less carcinogens. So technology can benefit the consumer, but it's never really been used to benefit the consumer. Um, whether or not that changes how, uh, the consumer feels about technology in their food, it remains to be determined, but it's never really been applied to consumer benefits up to now. I can give you an example. Um, I was touring some elementary schools in Vaisata district for my son. So, and most of them <laughs> would have the sign, we are proud uh, not to have GM food in our cafeterias. And the best schools, and uh, yeah. I can fight I, with that. So I, I'm trying yeah. to explain my son that. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, you ever seen the commercial with the lady with her Trisket? It's non-GM genetically modified, right? But it's wheat. There's no GM wheat grown anywhere in the world, you know. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was domesticated. That was a genetic modification process. But there's no transgenes in any wheat anywhere in the world. So it's just a, there's a disconnect in knowledge about how technology is being applied to food. So yeah, I didn't get my education here. So I'm wondering maybe just that's possible to lobby this kind of education in our elementary schools. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe just to have food science. Yeah. <laughs> So our lawmakers yep. aren't engineers by and large, they're not scientists by and large, they're lawyers by and large, and facts are less important than arguments that you can make, and the public has been, and I'm being signaled to be very careful here, <laughs> uh, but I had a slide on this, and that social media, whoever's the loudest, generally tends to sway people. And Dan isn't that noisy on social media, <laughs> I'm predicting, and neither am I. Um, so Perry, thank you very much for right here on, the, on your right side. Uh, thank you for uh, doing the uh, pitch for the lawyers. I come from the West Bank, I'm in the law school. Uh, and found this really interesting. <laughs> Um, and so my question might be completely, um, you know, a, a non-scientific question, so I hope you'll take it uh, at that. And, you know, you talked, both of you talked in, in several slides about um, the uh, slow pace in which things happened in the past and then the new technology that allows us to do things rapidly. And I guess my question is, is there value in the slow pace? Uh, in the sense that, you know, some mistakes and errors could be, uh, taken out, um, that, you know, in the uh, 10,000 years or whatever from the, the, the old uh, plant to the corn, we could figure out what uh, things we want there or not want there. And if we do this very, very fast, we might actually lose that ability of uh, uh, tweaking the process. Biology is messy and uncertain. You're absolutely right. And so you have to proceed with care and caution. Um, but, you know, I'm a scientist, but I was sort of thrown into the, this regulatory environment considering making products that would ultimately go to feed people and animals. And I, and I have to say, I was really impressed by the care consideration that was given 
So for example, the soybean, you know, I, I showed you examples of the kind of modifications we made, but we sequenced the whole genome. So we know, have we altered anything else in that genome? Is there anything else that might arise that's unpredictable? Probably not. We provided amino acid profiles, fatty acid profiles, secondary metabolite profiles. All of that data was presented, analyzed, and compared to other foods that we eat on a regular basis. So, yeah, I think caution is necessary. Caution is warranted. We're talking about food. But I've, my personal experience was that the regulatory policy that was in place, as it applies to plants, at least, um, you know, a lot of care and consideration was given over a year of time with back and forth feedback, additional data sets provided to ensure that it was, that it was safe for the public. So my thoughts on the matter are, I've lived my whole life, and that's fairly long, uh, without any of these products. I live in America, and we're doing just fine. Very few people starve in this country. Clearly, most people are overnourished rather than undernourished. But that's not the world. In a lot of the world, there actually is a problem. The second aspect of this is the population has more than doubled in my lifetime. The food supply is more than doubled in my lifetime. But we live in exponential times when everything is increasing exponentially, the time frames are slowing. We have an opportunity to help. We don't have to. My grandkids actually live in America. They'll be fine for a while. But if we don't get on top of this, we're in trouble. And I'll give you one example. I got started in this business in 1985 when Rudy Perpich wanted faster growing sports fish. And it was anticipated that Lake Mille Lacs and other sports fishing venues were going to perish. And that was a very major part of the northern Minnesota economy, an economy that most of us don't touch very much in, in our lives, except for maybe once or twice you know, a year. And he said, is there any way of saving the sports fishing industry because it's being fished out. And we made growth enhanced fish. And then Phyllis Kahn and her friends uh, at the state legislature argued that this might lead to a biological Chernobyl of the Mississippi River Basin if the fish got out of the lab. Well, they were designed to go actually into Minnesota lakes. The bottom line of the story is that the peak fishing of natural waters in the world peaked in 1997. That was 23 years ago. And the population has gone up by a couple of billion people and fish are a primary protein source. It was felt back then that it would be better not to have that protein source for people if it had the words GMO associated with it. If we don't start now, get the mistakes made early, then of course a lot of this technology will come in a bit too late. And maybe that's one way in which we'll limit the expenditure of worldwide resources. But that's not the decision we make. What we offer are tools. And it's up to other people to, to use them. Uh, I always come back to my personal level of food choice. Then uh, for me, the organic or not matters far more than GMO or not. I Means that when I think about that, that there are mix up, you know, the whether organic or not. You know, people, some people just in you know, GMO or not, in the same way over organic or not. You know, organic means, you know, no, you know, pesticides, no, you know, the herbicides kind of stuff. If GMO, you know, the genetic modification helps to reduce the insecticides or herbicides, 
that will really good help for our health. That means that uh, I believe you know, most of the people you know, when you think about the GMO, you know, they're putting you know, their uh, Roundup resistance gene and they spray all fields with, uh, you know, uh, with the insecticide. But uh, that's, not, that's a kind of long way to understand the effect of GMO. We can enhance the safety we can enhance the meaning of the food by doing a genetic modification, not reducing. So it means uh, in that meaning, you know, the, I, I don't have any issue for GMO. If that I can help through that, I can, uh, I can think that enhances the food safety. So it means uh, that's the way I take about uh, GMO foods, that regardless of plant or animals. I mean, I think it's a really good point. We didn't even address sort of environmental impacts and sustainability. Um, an example is potato. Um, most of the potatoes we grow are susceptible to the fungal blight that wiped out the potatoes in Ireland, you know, centuries ago, and you know, resulted in the potato, uh, the Irish potato famine. We know the resistance gene. We could move it into potato, we could edit existing potato so that it would be completely resistant, but we don't do that. So we instead we spray potatoes fields five times a year with very toxic chemicals to get rid of the fungus when we have a very simple and elegant genetic solution. So I think your point's well taken. We talked about food, but the environment, you know, savings and processing and waste. There's a, many applications of the technology uh, that or the technology could be used for many of those applications. Cows are very great machines to convert grass into human edible meat and milk. If we could increase the efficiency of that, that would help with this issue of food supply. But of course, it's not the cows who do the work. It's the rumen bacteria. Is there anyone working on the idea of generating, by GM processes, a more efficient rumen bacteria? Uh, we aren't, but the reason the cow has the rumen and the bacteria is to break down those fibers, the cellulose, the lignans uh, in the plants. Um, so what we did is we made an alfalfa that has less lignin and it makes more food available to the cow. So you don't have to feed the cow as much alfalfa, you get more milk from that cow, you don't need as many cows. Um, so it's not the microbiome solution, but it, it's, a, it's a plant solution. Well, I mean, there's, there's three elements here. One is the, one is the quality of the, of the grass that goes into the rumen. One is the, the ability of the, the efficiency, the metabolic efficiency of the cow in converting this to milk. Uh, but the third thing is indeed the, the, the rumen bacteria. That's, I was just curious whether that's, whether that's anybody's been working on that. Yeah, that I'm not certain of, but I think it's a great and, idea. And as, as a bureaucratic aside, would that be considered GM meat? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have to leave it there. I want to thank uh, Dan and, and Carrie once more for a great discussion. <laughs>